Mm-hmm. I tried to come through a long time ago. Did you? I'm here with June. Pardon? Oh. Amy. Amy what? Oh, I thought, it, I thought it was. You've been to us before, haven't you, Mr. Barton? Long time ago. Oh, yes. Lovely. Angels, girl. Yes? What have we met you now? Still... I was extremely odd. Yes? Trying to talk. Mm-hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you quite plainly now, thank you. Can you give me a talk this morning? Talk about anything you like. It's absolutely fantastic what's going on. This business of space. Yes. Yes. Oh, frightfully. Yes. Tremendously interesting. The world. Yes. Have you found uh, about anything out that that perhaps the astronauts not found anything out there? As far as I'm concerned, I've never been able to find a family who's never made the contact with other planets, not from this side. It's possible to make contact with Earth, yeah. occasionally anyway, with the aid of mediums and all that, but I don't know of anyone who's ever been in touch with anyone on other planets. Of course it may well be, but um, I have never, never met anyone. You have Can you hear me? Yes, very plainly, Mr. Oh, call me Amy for him. Amy. <laughs> Where's the other gentleman? There's usually someone else coming in. Yeah, Mr. Wood. Um, he's all right, but there's been such an awful epidemic of flu that he's not coming up. Be then to leave the little. Do you mean to say they haven't found a cure for flu yet? No. Goodness me, I'd have thought by now with all the things they're doing, they would have certainly found a cure for that, a preventative. Well, they do all sorts of things, Amy, that are really not. Uh, shall we say? I'm not terribly in touch with the world now. No, we well, haven't. Well, occasionally, it's just now and again, when I hear from various people things that are happening, but certainly the world doesn't seem to improve in some respects, does it? No. You were just saying before somebody came through that man doesn't only about the universal laws, and you're learning about those now, aren't you? Well, gradually, yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, people did understand more about this business of dying and life after death and the kind of world to some extent that they will find anyway. I mean, I just think it's dreadful. I think it's awful to think that people don't understand this. I know when I first came over here, it was a great shock. Yes, I know. You told us that makes sense to me. It must be a long time since I spoke to you. Some years, I suppose. About a couple of years. It is as long as that. Mm-hmm. Time is most peculiar with us. We're not subject to it anymore. Time, space, distance, so many things that apply on Earth don't seem to have the same meaning here. There is a form of time, I suppose, Mm -hmm. but it's not measured by the sun and the moon and stars and the calendar. No, quite. Um, Amy, what do you do with yourself now? Oh, I've had all sorts of interests. I've lost interest in flying, which I suppose some people must sound less strange, but of course one doesn't need to. (laughs) Anyway, one doesn't need... Mechanical things here. It's not necessary anymore. And what does Jim do? Oh, well, we have many interests. He's tremendously interested in developing himself mentally onto an entirely different stage altogether to anything he ever did on earth. He's very interested in, in music, too, and art. He's become much more, I don't know, much more sensitized, I think. Mm-hmm. You don't take any interest in flying, you don't take any interest in... No, not to ever know. I did at first, mm-hmm. but not now. Yeah. I used to come back, not that I was able to communicate, but I used to come back and take an interest in what was going on, but I find now that it just doesn't interest or appeal to me anymore. I suppose it is that over here one is able to do so many things. One is able to do things without, in a sense, any effort, and one doesn't have the need to sort of <laughs> go vast distances and... One doesn't have to sort of communicate even in the same way. In fact, life is so utterly, totally different that many of the things which seemed important are also they're not anymore. So in consequence, one just is not interested. I mean, one doesn't feel the urge or the need. What do you think now is the most important thing? Oh, my goodness me, you mean on earth? No, well, uh, the most important thing that is now affecting you now, what do you think is the most important thing? <laughs> 
suppose, really sort of trying to learn more and to express myself better in various ways. I think the whole thing is knowing more about evolution and evolving onto a different strata and sort of opening one's experience to wider horizons. I mean, I certainly don't think it's got anything whatever to do with um, material things. I mean, as I've already said, I'm not interested really to that extent in more new material things. I feel sad and sorry about the way the world is, and one would like to help if one can, but it seems to me that human beings will go on and on, making the same sort of mistakes, and I only hope is that sometime they'll begin to learn something from them and change accordingly. I think the only thing is that people understood this truth, realize the realities of it, I, I think it could help tremendously, but I think the vast majority of people are completely blind to it. They're not interested. They don't want to know. Exactly. That's what we come up against. Uh, I think that uh, in spite of religions, certainly it seems to me that often people who should know don't know. It seems often the blind leaving the blind. I don't think people are interested. I think they're no more materialistic than I am. And yet, when it comes to the point they perhaps they're told they might die or something like that, then they get all hit up. But well, everybody knows they've got to die. And they want to know more about it. And nobody seems to want to know anything about it, or very few. And everybody puts it off, you know, doesn't want to think about it, talk about it, and know about it. I mean, it seems to me the most important factors, the most important things in life, people push aside. I suppose I did. Most of us do. Deep on Earth, don't you think? I think it's, yes, I think we do. Except when you were flying, in those days you were flying, you sort of didn't worry about it. Oh, that's it. I think that when I was flying, but I don't know, I suppose it is being entirely on my own up there, as you might say, I had plenty of opportunity and time to think, and I did a tremendous amount of thinking. I think that in a kind of odd way, I was much nearer to what you call spiritualism or the realization of things than the average person. I didn't know anything practically, that is, from a practical point of view, I mean. But now, of course, I looking back, I, I realize that mentally I was, in a sense, very much in tune. I was highly sensitized by the very fact of, I suppose, my job. It may sound odd, but it's true. No, I think when you got on your own up aloft, you had time to think. Well, that's it. I think that one got away from people, got away from material things. And one was entirely, as it were, on one's own. And I think that mentally, in an odd, strange kind of way, you were in touch, put it like that. One wouldn't have said that at the time, one wouldn't have thought it perhaps, but it's extraordinary the things that seem to fly through one's mind, you know. And somehow death didn't seem to matter, one didn't fear it either. Most extraordinary sensation. I think a lot of flyers are like that. I think that they lose weight, in a sense, material weight, and problems seem to drift away from them. And when they see the vast space in front of them, it makes them think. Well, I think that's it. When you're up there and you see, it must be even more so than these astrals. I think that that's what makes it possible for them to do the things they do. I think that one realizes the immensity of life and that it's not just purely physical or material. I think that in an odd kind of way, you realize that you are much more than you seem and the body is merely well, just something that enables you to experience, but it's only obviously something that in itself is a means to the end and that it isn't the be-all and the end-all. I think that one gets this feeling when you are, as it were, away from Earth. Mm. Yeah. I know I look back on my life now and I see things so differently. I think that I had no fear, really. In a sense, I think I felt happier away from Earth and on it. I mean, of course, I had my moments when I enjoyed things, but I don't know. I was always happiest when I was away from the Earth in the plane. I think I was more more myself. And that was because, in a kind of odd way, I was out of myself. I realize now that this was a psychic experience. Mm. You had an inner realization? Yes, well, I wouldn't have called it that at the time. I wouldn't have known what it was. But I was really, in a sense, being more tuned in. I think I was out of the earth sort of environment and condition and away from the contamination of material things and in some odd way I was sort of being mentally and spiritually sort of tuned in. I know this sounds weird, but it's true. Anyway, do you think um, that 
looking back now on your flying career, do you think there was, now that you realize things, do you think there were times when you were possibly helped by somebody, uh, a flyer, say, from the other side who had been a flyer on Earth? I think that's uh, to a point. Like Campbell helped, helped Donald Campbell. Yes, to a point, but no, again, I think the name from judging my own experience of things, trying to help people on the earth is a very difficult thing. You may be able to influence them to a certain extent mentally, and there again, it depends on the individual. Mm. And um, the state and condition of the world being what it is, it's very difficult for us to do very much. We would like to, but it's not until people themselves make the effort, you know, sort of mentally sort of want to be helped, you know, sort of really to have some extent make it possible. All this business of being helped, I mean, often people when they're in difficulty and trouble, they sort of mentally sort of ask for help, or perhaps they even pray for help, and sometimes they're fortunate and sometimes they are helped. But quite often it's useless because until you open the door, you can't expect anyone to enter in. And so many people really, without even realizing it, not only shut the door, but put the bolt and bar on. Experience that you see, the whole point is that if a person wants to find out and to know, then to some extent they've got to, well, open the door. You know, I mean, they've got to sort of have some faith. They've got to uh, answer the door when someone knocks and not sort of, sort of just have it ajar and sort of peek round the corner. They've got to have some faith and open the door wide so the person can come in. It's no good sort of just standing there and sort of being afraid and apprehensive as to whether you'll pull the bar or the bolt, you know, and open the door a bit. I mean, I realize to some extent it's understandable that people are doubtful and, and fearful and what have you, but unless they make some efforts, then there's not much that we can do to help them. However hard you try to push the bar. Depends on the individual to a great extent. There must be reciprocation, there must be effort, there must be... I mean, for instance, in any field of activity, quite apart from this, being able to communicate or wanting to communicate and, and so on, and knowing something of this truth, I mean, the whole point is that in, in every walk of life, unless you take risks, unless you're prepared to make the effort to find out and to experiment and to really, in a sense, sort of go all out, I mean, you, you just don't achieve anything. I mean, the whole trouble is that the vast majority of people are afraid. They're full of fear. That's the trouble of the world. David, you help us in our work. Do you understand that? In our work? You know, of course, you know what we're doing. Yes, of course, but I, I can't honestly say that I do. I mean, yeah. it isn't that I'm not interested, but I haven't felt the desire to come back very much. Mm -hmm. What sort of work would you like to do while you're on the other side? Well, I know this will sound crazy, but I'd like to educate children. Right, to educate children. Well, yes, I'm very interested in children. I wasn't terribly interested on Earth. And as a matter of fact, children rather worried me. But possibly that's the more the reason why I'm becoming interested now. I'm interested in young souls and trying to help them and trying to teach them. And actually, I do, in a sense, quite a lot of that work now. When they come over? Yes. And there are many young children here who really need help and guidance. And I find it's stimulating and... I'm able to help quite a lot. And how do you set about it, David? Well, that rather depends on the child. What applies to one wouldn't necessarily apply to another. How you help one child wouldn't necessarily be right for another. And this is another interesting aspect. And in a sense, when we talk about children, they're not necessarily always children as such. Sometimes they're very immature people. Uh, yes. uh, and we do get people come over here who were very retarded on earth and mentally sort of, well, not... You know, I mean, they really um, are like children. I, I, we have vast places here, like lecture halls and places where people can go and be helped. And I suppose you call them kind of clinics, come hotel, come schools, come yeah. colleges. You know, I mean, vast places, so vast. And there's so much that one can do and learn oneself, even when one's helping others. It's amazing how even sometimes people who you wouldn't think could teach you very much can teach you a great deal. One learns about life all the time from people. Sometimes people on a much higher plane or state of being, and sometimes from people that, quite frankly, in some respects, of course, haven't progressed at all. You see, that is the joy and beauty of it, that one can meet all sorts of people and all walks or strangers of being, you know, and learn all the time and teach all the time, too. It, it, one sort of feels all the time there's something fresh and new and exciting. 
every second if one can use time, you know? Oh, you made a very interesting point there, Amy. You talk about mentally retarded people coming over there like children. Now, there's a person, a Mongol, you know, some of the Mongols, yes. come over as they are, as a Mongol. Yeah, well, no, they don't in a sense. I mean, they don't suddenly become very bright. Mm -hmm. But um, they are more, shall we say, uh, how do Not I quite think? so much as they are. Well, no, it's very difficult to explain this because the physical side is purely physical anyway. Yes. And um, that no longer applies. So therefore, they are not under the same condition, uh, with the same handicap. But of course, there has been a retarded condition, a uh, mental condition, and it is this mental aspect that we have to work on. But usually, of course, they are quite bright in themselves, even when on earth. It's just that they cannot express themselves, or their brain doesn't function properly. But it doesn't also the fact that there is the ability there, there is the possibility, and of course here it is all ability and possibility to achieve. Uh, and of course, under the different conditions, they are different, and they're much more able to assimilate knowledge and experience, and much more teachable, you know, and we don't have the same sort of problems, obviously, as you would on earth, because it isn't the same physical material body, it's a rarefied body, and it is a perfect body, it, and whereas a person may have had an imperfect body, physically, here yeah, they have a perfect body, which immediately brings about certain changes anyway, and then, of course, it is a matter of adjustment with the mind and the spirit, as it were, as one, in tune with the, as you call it, etheric body. It's, it's a combination of harmony, you see. Whereas you know, there is this harmony in your world, not only with uh, deformed children, so, but with the, or every human being practically, in a sense, there is this harmony. But see, this is the thing that you have to do. You have to start to create harmony. You have to become, as it were, tuned in. And this is the hardest part for most people when they first come here. And much harder sometimes for people who've got very strong, fixed, firm views and ideas, because they create stumbling blocks. Sometimes it's easier for a child, even one that is imperfect, and one that uh, didn't have the ability to think clearly, Sometimes it's even easier for them uh, to assimilate and become different people and advance selves. And it is the people who on earth may have been considered very brilliant and advanced, who are full of, shall we say, false values and false ideas and strong opinions, and much more difficult for them perhaps to change, and in consequence advance than perhaps someone who was, might have been the village idiot, for instance. Can you tell when the, why they're meant to retire, or why they're can you tell them what it's called? That is a well, it's usually physical. Usually, I think invariably it's physical. It's not an undeveloped spirit coming to the side too soon. There might be exceptional circumstances or cases where that may be, but I don't think so. I don't think it was ever intended that anyone should have been born imperfect, either mentally or physically. I think this is what man himself has created over eons of time, and although one doesn't like the old adage about the sins of the fathers falling on the children, because it all sounds so unjust and, and very unfair, but then again, if one sees more clearly that one is the product of other people, uh, in every sense, I mean, mentally, physically, in every way, not just of one's parents either, because when you realize you're all sharing the same spirit, and that you're all brought into being in a material sense in the same way, that you're all sort of linked up, and that after all said that, I don't think that if it can be anything else, like if generations of people think wrongly, then they're bound to recreate and create wrongly, you know, and they're bound to be imperfections, because you cannot think wrong without acting wrong, and the physical conditions of the past must catch up with the present and the future. I think that uh, everything that happens is logical in as much that man has set the conditions, created the situation, and made it possible for whatever happens to happen. Everything really can be traced back to man himself. I, I think that if you have imperfect children, that it's man is to blame. You may say the parents are perfect physically, but they may be mentally far, far from perfect, or there may be imperfections way back uh, on either side of the family or both, 
and which will eventually catch up. You see, the whole thing is that there's no such thing really, in a sense, as an individual uh, identically, or shall we say, purely on its own. One likes to think so, but everyone's a product of other people's thoughts and minds, uh, and uh, to some extent, physical bodies too. You see, once you realize that the whole of the universe is part and parcel, of the other. I mean, every individual is part of someone else, and that you are all part and parcel of the same spirit, the same manifestation of flesh even. I mean, it may take different shapes or forms. You have the animal kingdom, but they're still linked up with the human race. Yeah. And if you treat animals badly, then in some odd way, don't ask me how, but it re will eventually reflect upon them, the individuals. It will reflect upon the human race. You have to experience what you create. Of course you do. I mean, this is law, natural law. In other words, you cannot escape from natural law. And you're bound to have all these things happen that distress one's hair because man has made it possible. And the law of attraction come in too, Amy. I mean, a child is attracted to its parents. The soul, the spirit is attracted to that, those type of parents. Well, I find this rather an odd question in a way because it rather suggests that um, there is consciousness of the individual before being born, yeah. waiting or for looking for a suitable parent, you see, or parents are. Surely, uh, this is not the only world, there are seen millions and millions of other worlds. Um, well, I only know a material, physical world, the Earth, yeah, but and, and the spiritual worlds which um, I've had some experience of. But actually, there's no real... But then again, you see, all these different worlds are different aspects of man's evolution. Right. And uh, if you're asking me, is the life on various planets, well, then it may well be that some of the spirit world is connected or is uh, some of the planets are part of the spirit world, yes. But, um, you see, we don't quite think in the same way, I suppose. Man looks upon the, the earth as the earth world, and he looks upon the moon, and now man has reached the moon, he looks upon that as another world, which in a sense it is, which is a dead world, more or less. Uh, although there is a full life. life yes, but it's not the same, you know, I mean, it's um, not life as you know it. No. And therefore, to man, in a sense, it's a dead world, from the point of human intelligence. But um, there are other worlds, and there are beings, uh, but they are, as far as I know, beings who are part of man, uh, who are part of the earth, in a sense. Uh, though they're separated by, well, I suppose centuries upon centuries of time and miles upon miles of a so-called distance, which is all part of the same world. You know, uh, it's very odd, but I can't explain it any better. See, there are souls in your world who have never, never been on the earth at all, they've bypassed the earth through their evolution. Well, that may be, I wouldn't know. But as far as oh, I know, yeah. all the people I've ever contacted have had existence yeah. on Earth at some previous time and have evolved. Yeah. So as far as I can see, that, that is the meaning of life, evolution. Uh, it is on Earth and it is over here and it's just a matter of continuation. That is why now, of course, I understand there's no beginning and no end, uh, which used to puzzle me. And when I thought about it at all, you know, one, I don't think that anything is new in a sense. I think that everything has been discovered, sometimes on earth been lost, and sometimes it's found again, sometimes it takes centuries, no doubt. It seems to me that so much is there waiting to be discovered, and it's always been there. I don't know. But evolution takes uh, all different forms. It, it, it don't have to repeat this earth as the only one uh, form of evolution could take. As I said, it can by the could well be. I mean, it's I only know that one evolves yeah, right. personally yeah. as a human being onto a higher strata of realization, and uh, there may be all sorts of other experiences. But you don't have to come through this earth to evolve, actually. Not always. Not well, that may be. I don't know. I, I don't know. I've always understood that the earth was. I was going to say the nursery, I don't know. Well, that's only another point at all, anyway. It seems logical. Uh, but, uh, anyway, I must go, well, but yeah, I'll come again right sometime, right. and I do hope um, your friend as well. Well, he's all right, but he's, uh, he'll come up in the... And perhaps he'll be able to come again soon. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Anyway, next time, perhaps Jim will come. Well, that's 
Anyway, bye bye. Goodbye, Amy. Thank you bye -bye. very much. Bye bye. Goodbye, Mr. Bye bye. 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 Bye bye.